last Wednesday night, I announced it several weeks ago that I was going to speak about the eternal rewards that we receive. And I used the scripture last week. If you have, wasn't here and you want to turn back there, it's 1 Corinthians, the third chapter. Uh, we read verse 8 through verse 15. Not going to go back there, uh, read it, but at least if you want to go back and refresh your memory, you can. And then I talked about uh, the first crown that we're going to receive. I didn't get very far into that. It was in James, the first chapter, and it was in verse 2. And it's called the, the crown of the life, if you remember. How many of you have that in your notes? It was the crown of the life. The crown of life is also sometimes called the lover's crown. And uh, we find that uh, strength according to the word of, uh, to overcome temptation and to endure trials through the love of God. How many of you know how true that is? If it wasn't for the love of God, what would we do when we got in the middle of a trial? We wouldn't know what to do. We wouldn't know how to handle it. And so we know it's the, the power of God that he gives us and without his love in our hearts Trials uh, uh, can cause us to become bitter. You ever had something happen to you and made you angry? And you had to catch yourself? I was uh, speaking to someone just last week at, uh, during a time of death, and uh, they were angry. They were just, just totally angry. And they were mad at God for, you know, for the loss. And uh, I understand that trials can come, but that's what happens to us, uh, you know, when uh, we don't have the love of the Lord in our hearts. Uh, that's what the scripture is telling us, that, uh, that trials can cause us to become better and it can cause us to become critical. And then, I mean, no, that's true. We can get really critical of a lot of people, a lot of things. And if we do, what we do is we lose our crown. We don't want to lose our crown. We want to be able to finish. And I hope uh, that you can go back and reflect on that. And this is also the crown that uh, is revealed for being faithful unto death. I remember saying that to you last Wednesday night. Revelation chapter 2 and verse 10. We're not going to go back and read all of it again, but all believers, uh, if you are saved, then you have eternal life. But that all believers will be rewarded the crown of life. There's a difference in just being saved and being rewarded the crown of life. And, and in order to receive the crown of life, uh, we got to remember that we have to love the Lord more than our own lives. Remember I said it. If you're going to receive the crown of life, you've got to love God more than yourself. And some of us uh, really need to work on that. A lot of people you know are caught up in themselves, and uh, that's just not the way it ought to be. I was reading uh, in the Scripture in Mark uh, chapter 8, verse 35, where it spoke to us about that. we got to love the Lord with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. we got to love Him with everything uh, that is within us. So uh, we've got to live for Christ, and we've got to endure temptation and trials and, and the power of of his love will help us to be able to do that, okay? And that's where I, I think I left off last week. So tonight, we're going to start with the second crown, and it is the crown of rejoicing, if you're taking notes. Uh, and it's in the book of 1 Thessalonians, and we're going to read together, the book of 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 19 and verse 20. And when you read this, Brother Chris is going to read, uh, the, it's called the crown of rejoicing uh, as you read the word of the Lord. And it's called that because of some things that we are able to do. 
and this is what the word said about it. The greatest work that we can do is mentioned in these scriptures. If you don't mind, read 1 Thessalonians 2, verse 9 and 10. Everybody listen up. 19 and 20. Uh, 19 and 20 I'm sorry. For, for what is our hope, our joy, or the crown in which we will in which we will glory in the presence of our Lord Jesus when he comes. Is it not you? Indeed, you are, you are our glory and joy. So the greatest privilege that we have, read this word, it's a, it's a do for the Lord what he wants us to do. If we want to be able to uh, enjoy the crown of rejoicing that he's speaking of, in, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. And th there's a lot of scripture here that I want to present to you. First of all, I want you to know uh, and, and help me to be able to answer the question. He's talking about in Thessalonians there about winning uh, the crown of rejoicing. And one of the ways we do that is by winning souls. How many of you know how important it is to win somebody to the Lord? And I'm not going to ask for a show of hands. There are a lot of Christians that live their whole lifetime, go to church, do all they're supposed to do, and never win a soul to the Lord. Not one. That is not the will of God for us. Brother Holland, it's so hard. I know it's hard. But there's a reward. That's why God emphasized how important it is that the rewards that we get for that, for winning the, uh, the loss. And so why should we win souls? And I want to show you four reasons why tonight. Number one is in Proverbs chapter 11 and verse 30. Proverbs chapter 11, verse 30. Brother Chris, listen to this. The fruit of righteousness, uh, the fruit, the, the fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and the one who is wise saves lives. So here the Bible says that it's wise to win people that are lost. It's a wise thing. That's one of the things that God wants us to understand. Uh, I was talking to Brother Graham the other day, and, and he was you know, he's doing some a lot of witnesses, as a matter of fact, in the nursing home. And uh, I, he was quoting the scripture to me that he that went of souls uh, is wise. And, you know, we look at it one way, but when I got through talking to him, the Holy Spirit said, tell him that it takes a wise man to win a soul. We, we sometimes read that scripture, he that went of souls is wise, like we, but that's not necessarily what it's talking about. You got to be, in this generation, so many people don't want to hear. They don't want, they can talk to them about football, softball, baseball, soccer, uh, you know, whatever, but they don't want to talk about Jesus. They don't want to hear the word of the Lord. As a matter of fact, on Fox News last night, I heard that the majority of Americans don't even believe in the Bible anymore. They don't believe the word. It's not important to their lives. So here we're reading the word of the Lord and it says in Proverbs 11, 30, uh, it's wise to win the loss. And the woods are full of them. I said, Brother Holland, I don't know. You know many people that don't know Jesus. And we just need to share uh, other gospel with them. And then not only is it wise to win the loss, uh, but it's a a work against sin. If we will win the loss and enjoy the crown of rejoicing, then we got to do a work against sin. That's backwards. But I was reading in the scripture in James chapter 5 and verse 20. You might want to follow along. Look what he said. James 5 verse 20. Remember this, whoever turns a sinner from the error of their way will save them from death and cover over a multitude of sins. So, winning the lost is a war against sin. How many of you believe we ought to? Jesus died for what? 
He literally came and died for our sin, right? And for the sins of the world. Amen? So don't you think we ought to, as Christians, amen, don't you think we ought to join in that fight? Well, I'll never thought about it like that. Well, if you read the scripture in James, he said, it's a work against sin. It's a warfare against sin. Amen. Instead of compromising, amen, instead of watering down everything, amen, why don't we accept the responsibility and recognize we're in a, we're in a world where there are many millions of people that are living their lives in sin. Amen. So if we're going to receive the crown of rejoicing, that's what we're speaking about here uh, in First Thessalon Thessalonians uh, chapter 2. You, you can see how important it is that we join in the fight against sin. Amen. Let's go one more. Turn to Luke chapter 15 and verse 10. And here uh, it talks about why should we win souls? Because of, uh, it's a, a cause for joy in heaven. Well, that's an amazing reason. Read it in the scripture. Amen. In Luke chapter 15, verse 10, Brother Crit. In the same way, I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. So if we are wise, we win souls. If we are saved, we ought to be in the war against sin, not for sin, we're against sin. No compromising, no watering it down, no patting sin on the tail. Amen? But we ought to be in a war against it. And then, uh, according to the scripture, if we win a soul, if we join in that fight and lead somebody into the kingdom of God, what happens in heaven? Did you read it in the scripture? We'll read it one more time. Listen to what happens in heaven with the angels. In the same way, I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. There's rejoicing in heaven among the angels over one person that we lead from sin unto salvation. So is it important for us as a body of believers, we, as Christians, is it important for us to win the loss? Or should we just go to church and, and be thankful for our four and no more, eh? You know, so to speak. That, that's not the will of God. You know, sometimes in church, and I don't mean to be ugly here, but sometimes we get so complacent. We really do. We get so comfortable, and that's okay in some occasions. We get so comfortable with just our group. And, and when somebody new comes, it's almost like, uh, what are they doing here? You know, we, we wonder. But that's not the purpose and the plan of God. He wants us to join in the fight against sin and to be wise, to win the loss, and, and to bring somebody to Christ and create some joy in heaven. Amen. Among the angelic host of God. Why should we win souls? There's a lot of reasons there. And one more reason, and I'll move on, but it's in Daniel chapter 12 and verse 3, where the Bible says that if we win a soul, that something happens to us. Amen? We begin to shine as the stars, as the brightness of of the firmament. It's called the word. So read it, Daniel 12, verse 3. Those who are wise will shine like the brightness of the heavens, and those who lead many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. So don't you think it's a fulfillment of God? Don't you think He wants us to shine? Don't you do you? Do you think God wants you? Why? Uh, did he say in the word for us to come out from among the world and be separate? That, that he wants us to be different. He's not wanting us to be some weird ducklings, but he does want us to be different than the sinners. 
He wants to be different than, than the world that's where sin is abounding. Amen? And He's made it available to us and He shows us in the Word. Why? It's because uh, if, we're, if we win souls, we're going to shine like the stars and, and there's going to be a brightness about our lives. Don't you think in a dark world that they deserve somebody that will shine among them? Amen? Our world's in a mess, wouldn't you say? There's a lot of darkness out there. Amen? So don't you want to don't you want to go and, and, and witness to somebody? Don't you want to go uh, and just win one person in your lifetime? Look around the room tonight, and I don't want to try to make you feel guilty, but look around, there's probably 35 or 40 of us in here. If every one of us would purpose in our heart that we would win one soul this year, the whole year, just win one, focus, win one soul, where will we be this time next year? Amen? We'd have to move back to the sanctuary and uh, build a new building or whatever we needed to do. We'd have to be able to do that. Amen? So it's important, and it is God's plan. And the, the whole reason that I spoke about it is uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 19 and 20, where we just read, if we do that, if we win souls, if we shine as the brightness of the firmament, if we create joy in the heaven, you know what we do? We receive a crown of rejoicing. You get a crown for that when you get to heaven. Well, brother, I don't worry. If I just barely make it in, that's all I want. Man, that's not the attitude we need to have. Amen. We need to be thankful that God's given us the privilege of being able to win the loss. Look, the second thing I thought about under the crown of rejoicing is to answer a question, how? Why do we win so? But how do we win so? Well, I don't even ever talk about that. Well, I want to do it tonight. How do we win so? Anybody got an idea? Anybody want to offer a, an opinion about that in here? How do we do it? That thing is hot in here. Would you turn that thing down a little cooler? That's 73. Y'all not hot? Man, I'm sweating. <laughs> I'm making work. I got to pay the bill. I might as well be cool. <laughs> Hey, Rachel, uh, man, it's just hot in here, right? How do we win souls? Are y'all hot? You hot over there? Y'all must be sitting on the vent. Huh? Maybe I need to get over here where it's cool. It's not hot, it's hot up here. How do we win souls? Look, I gave you an opportunity, but here's, here's what the Bible said uh, about it. We can win souls, number one, by the example that we set. By our example. Pretty important. Amen? How we conduct ourselves, the example that we set. And, uh, you know, others, if they can see Christ in us, right? We understand uh, if they can see Christ in us as we respond properly to the situations in life. If people can see Christ in us as we respond properly to the situations in life, then we could win so. But if we have circumstances, situations, and we fly off the handle, anybody ever flew off the handle? Yeah, you wouldn't admit it if you did in front of me, would you? Huh? Some of us, 
some of us get mad at the drop of a hat. And I've dropped a hat a few times myself. <laughs> so we've got to be careful, right? I, I know it's quiet, but guys, how many of you want to win a crown? Well, you've got to listen, and you've got to respond properly to the circumstances of life. Well, Brother Holly, excuse my friends. No, we can't do that. Well, this is the way my mama was. That won't work either. Well, I learned this from my daddy. That don't mean nothing. We can't, we can't operate like that. Amen. We have to do what the Bible said. And I want to show it to you in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 2. This is what the Bible said uh, about how we win. So 2 Corinthians 3 verse 2. Brother Chris, listen. You yourselves are our letter written on our hearts, known and read by everyone. We are what? We are like a letter. And we are read by who? What are the words that? We are read by everyone. So if you're going to win soul and you don't respond properly to circumstances in your life, People are reading you, according to the word, they're reading you like a letter that's been written. Pretty clear, isn't it? Never thought about it, Brother Holland. Well, we just gotta we just gotta learn. We got none of us are perfect, I certainly am not. But we've got to work at it, guys. Hey Amen. How many of you know us? Being saved and staying saved is it's work. But we won't admit it. Oh, Bill Holland's a, it's a rose bed of ease. I've never found it to be like that. It's a battle. It's a warfare. Every day of our life. And so we need to understand how important it is. So we can win souls by what? Number one, by the example that we set. Amen? All right? The second thing uh, is in Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, where the Bible said that we can lead others to Christ with our mouth. And if you study the Word, I think we need to witness. That's how you use your mouth. You witness verbally for Christ, and then you trust the Holy Spirit to give us the power that we need to be effective. Amen. God doesn't is, expect us to just go out in the street and do it ourselves. He'll give us the power to do it, according to the Word. And I want you to look at it in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Listen to what he said, Brother Chris. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witness in Jerusalem, and in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Unto the uttermost, King James, in, in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, unto the uttermost parts of the earth. You will be my witness, said. Amen. So, how do we witness? I know we can do it. Uh, by example, number one. But don't you think we ought to use our mouth every once in a while to witness about how good God is? Just be a witness. We just got through singing the song, Jesus, use me, don't refuse me. Uh, surely there's a work that I can do. And one of the things I think we can all do is become a witness and we can lead others to Christ just by the witness that we offer. Amen. I mean, I don't want you to come witness to me if you've got a bird in your hand. 
I knew you were going to get on something ugly, brother. I don't know. You don't know what bud is. That's not a bud of a flower. It's bud wiser. Don't, don't witness to me and tell me how good everything is and you got to, y'all didn't get it? I got to talk more plain? Look, don't, man, don't smell like a brewery. Brewery, Hey, man, and then tell me about how good God is. Hey, you know what? He's good to the sinner too. But that's not the witness that God wants from us. Boy, it's quiet. It's cool here, too, where I'm standing. Yeah, Amen. it's very cool. Amen. <laughs> so we need to be that witness. Amen. Be example. Use your mouth to be a witness for the Lord. And then turn to Philippians chapter 4. Verse 15 through verse 17, we're going to read again. And the Bible here says that we can win souls through our givings. Well, hold on, you ain't going to get on something bad in a minute. Well, it's important. We can win souls by giving. And I think, this is my opinion, Sister Yvonne taught on it really well, Brother Jim taught on it really well, I think we ought to all, if we're saved, we ought to all pay tithe. Anybody agree with me? Yeah. Most of you do already do it. And I'm thankful for that. But that's one of the ways we can win souls. We, we should give tithe. How many believe we ought to give an offering too? It's in the Word. I'm going to show it to you. Uh, in the word uh, of the Lord. And what we do, according to the word, here in the scripture, in Philippians, when we give tithes, when we give offerings, maybe we're not preachers, but we can help other people that are. That's one of the benefits of giving. That's how churches function. That's how missionary work gets done. It's done by people of that deal are according to the word. And so we're going to read it. In Philippians chapter 4, begin with verse 15, read through 17. But Chris, listen, everybody, follow along. Moreover, as you Philippians know, in the early days of your acquaintance with the gospel, when I set out from Macedonia, not one church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving, except you only. For even when I was in Thess Thessalonica, you sent me aid more than once when I was in need. Not that I desire your gifts. What I desire is that more be credited to your account. So here he is saying and giving honor to that one church, that one group that says we want to help you. And they gave to him. And so he gave them credit in the word. Is that, is that how you interpret that? He was out winning the loss, sharing the good news of the gospel, and not many people were willing to help him. But the ones that did help, he wrote about. Amen. And so I believe according to the word, how do we win souls? By giving by giving tithe and by giving offerings so that the gospel can be carried, so the church can function, so the, the literature can get in the hands of the right people. I mean, there's a lot of reason. Giving is a very important thing. And uh, if we do, and I'm going to say this again, those three things about how do we win the, the loss and if we do those things, there's going to be much rejoicing when the lost are saved. We read it in the Word. Heaven is going to rejoice. The angels are going to rejoice. There's going to be a lot of rejoicing. The Bible said it in Luke chapter 15 and verse 10. 
Uh, a couple of verses here I want to point out to you again. Read it. Luke 15, verse 10. Listen to this. In the same way I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Rejoicing in the presence of God over one sinner. Praise God for the hope for one soul uh, to be saved. And then he didn't stop there. The new believers rejoice. Read it in Acts chapter 8, verse 39. Acts 8, 39. When they came up out of the water, the spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away, and the eunuch did not see him again, but went on his way rejoicing. He came up out of the water, and he went on his way rejoicing. If you understand what he's speaking about uh, here tonight, heaven rejoices, and then you believers, uh, uh, you know, they also rejoice in the in the Lord. We read it in Acts 8 chapter. It made it very clear. New believers rejoice. And then one more. I want to go to John chapter 4 and verse 36, where it says, the sower and the reapers rejoice together. It's a powerful thing. John 4, verse 36. Even now the one who reaps draws a wage and harvests a crop for eternal life, so that the sower and the reaper may be glad together. So in the word of the Lord, we see how important it is. There is the crown of rejoicing all in the word but we've got to be wise enough we we've got to uh, stand up and work against sin we've got if we do we're going to cause joy in heaven our lights are going to so shine before men that they'll see our good works and they will glorify our father uh, which is in the heaven and then the way we do that is respond properly to the situations in life and open our mouths and witness and stand against sin. And if we will do it, God will bless us. And we can also do it by giving, offering, and by sharing and giving our tithing unto the Lord. It causes a lot of good things. But the main thing you receive from those things is the crown of rejoicing. When you get to heaven. Amen. Amen. The crown of rejoicing. So let's go to the third crown. The crown of righteousness. Third crown. The crown of righteousness. It's in 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 8. And the crown of righteousness is the crown that is earned by believers who eagerly anticipate the second coming of Christ. They, they know he's coming and they, they anticipate eagerly the return of Christ. Read it, Brother Chris. 2 Timothy 4, verse 8. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness which which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. So there's going to be a crown of what? Crown of righteousness. And here he said it was given to him. And, you know, it's no wonder if you read the scripture, Paul said uh, in 2 Timothy uh, uh, chapter 4 verse 7 we all know that verse pretty much he said I uh, you know I have fought what a good fight remember that and, and then uh, you know in this uh, uh, realm of spiritual warfare Paul was able to win the battle the battles of his life and so he could say I have what I finished my course. Amen. We're talking about uh, here the crown of righteousness. Amen. And, and then, that was in verse 7. 
And, and then in the course of his travel, uh, there was no detouring around the hard places in his life. Paul understood what it was like to, to have a thorn in the flesh. He understood what it was like to be buffeted uh, on every side. He understood the difficulty uh, of walking out the Christian experience. But he said, I fought a good fight. And if you read the word, he said, I finished the course. Uh, and then if you uh, go a little bit further down, when it comes to travel, there was no detouring around it because there was no looking back in his life. In, in Luke uh, chapter 9, verse 61 and verse 62, I think it made it very clear. A lot of folks start in the race, but they give up on the testing time. They give up and they go back. But in Paul, he fought a good fight, he finished the course, and there was no looking back in his life. Read it in the Word, in Luke 9, uh, verse 61 and 62. Listen. Still another said, I will follow you, Lord, but first let me go back and say goodbye to my family. Jesus replied, no one who puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. No one that starts out in this race and gives up is fit for the kingdom of God. That's what Paul said. I fought a good fight. I finished the course. And he said, even when the Lord called him, called him out, uh, uh, Luke called him out to follow him. He said, let me go back and tell my family goodbye. Jesus said, no. He that puts his hand to the plow and looks back is not fit for the king. Amen. So if we're going to have and receive the crown of righteousness, we got to stay steady. we got to follow him. You can't be on that roller coaster, in and out, up and down, when I feel like it. Uh, you know, that's not the way it is. That's what the Word has made clear to us. And, and instead of looking back, Paul kept his eyes on the Lord. And this is the key in Philippians chapter 1 and verse 6. I, I know I'm giving you a lot of scripture, but I, I don't want to say it unless I can back it up. Look at it. Philippians chapter 1 verse 6. Listen to what Paul said. Being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. So he's making it clear here, Paul kept his eyes on the Lord. And he knew that if he kept his eyes on the Lord, even though God had helped him start out in this race, that same God would give him the strength to finish the race. That's why... You're in the work. That's why he said, I fought a good fight. I kept the faith. I finished the course. Therefore, henceforth, there's a laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give to those that are looking for him when he shall appear. And look, guys, there's no reason to go back. There's really nothing out there to go back to. So if we want the crown of righteousness, we've got to persevere. We've got to keep moving on. In Acts chapter 20, and I'll move on, but Acts chapter 20, uh, verse 24, there's a group of verses through verse 31. We might read it, but he preached all the counsel of God. And if you listen to the counsel of God there in Acts 20, start with verse 24. We might read it. Amen. However, I consider my life worth nothing to me. Only my aim is to finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me. Stop right there. He's confessing. I, I want this crown of righteousness. And if I'm going to get it, my life don't mean anything to me. What I want to do is not the most important thing. Where I want to go is not the most important place. The most important thing is that I keep my eyes focused on Jesus. Is that too hard? I mean, I think that's too hard. 
Well, we'll read the, go on and listen to the rest of that. And complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me, the task of testifying to the good news of God's grace. Now I know that none of you among whom I have gone about preaching the kingdom will ever see me again. Therefore, I declare to you today that I am the innocent, that I am innocent of the blood of any of you. For I have not hesitated to proclaim to you the whole will of God. Keep watch over yourselves and all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, the shepherds of the church of God, which he bought with his own blood. I know that after I leave, savage wolves will come in among you and will not spare the flock. Even from your own number, men will arise and distort the truth in order to draw away disciples after them. So be on, be on your guard. Remember that for three years, I never stopped warning each of you night and day with tears. So here, here he's teaching us he, to just adhere to, and he preached. There's a lot of people trying to misconstrue what he said. But he preached the whole counsel of God. And even when they accused him of not, he said, I know some of you accused me of not telling the truth. But I have not failed to tell you the truth. How important is that? That we get and adhere to the full counsel of God. That kind of uh, puts an extreme uh, importance on uh, a a pastor, an evangelist, or a Bible teacher that don't water this thing down. Amen. There's a lot of people out there watering it down. They're not, they're not telling the full truth because they got these big old buildings to fill up. And I understand that. I mean, you have to be careful that the right of money, amount of money comes in to, to, to have some of them super domes that they have like you see on television. They got to have millions and millions and millions. Everybody say millions. They got to have millions of dollars, right? And a lot of them, not all of them, but a lot have compromised the counsel of God in order to get those seats filled, in order to have that money turn over. And I like seats full, and I like money to turn over. But I've declared to you guys, I will not compromise the word of the Lord to get it. We can't compromise. We can't do it. And that's what Paul was talking about. If you're going to enjoy and wear the crown of righteousness, you can't. You can't. Just can't compromise. And I think it's made really clear uh, in the scripture for us. And I got five minutes and I'll cover one more crown. Is that right? The fourth crown is the crown of glory. The crown of glory. It's in 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 4. The crown of glory. The crown of glory. And, and, and look, uh, I'm going to toot the horn for the guys and the girls that are standing up for what's, what's right. Okay? Because the crown of glory is a special reward for faithful, obedient, God-called ministers or preachers or pastors. And that could be a lot of us. It's not just talking about the guy in the pulpit. But I want you to know it's a crown of glory, the Bible said. Read it. First Peter chapter 5, verse 4. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that will never fade away. So it's a crown for faithful, obedient, God-called ministers. And I'm going to say pastors. The chief shepherd himself, the Bible said, gives that crown. You understand that? Who, who do you think the chief shepherd is? When, when, when the pastors or the ministers that have been faithful for the Christ and they get to heaven, the chief shepherd 
It's going to issue that crown. Wouldn't that be amazing to, to walk inside the, the gates of heaven and have Jesus say, welcome home, son or daughter. I'm glad you fought the fight. I'm glad you finished the race. So here it is. It's the crown that I want to give you, a crown of glory. And I'm going to give it to you myself. I don't know if he's got other uh, uh, celestial beings that are going to participate in giving out the crowns. There may be. But if you are a minister and a preacher and a pastor and you're standing in the gap and you're preaching the truth, he's going to reward you personally. That sounds pretty good, don't it, Brother Mac? And then when we get to heaven, you read it uh, in the word of the crown of glory. And, and the Bible said uh, in Matthew chapter 10 and verse 4, or verse 41, I believe it is, uh, listen to what it, it's an eternal crown and it will not fade away. L listen to the word. And if you will understand it, it will help you. God will reward those who support his chosen servants through prayer and encourage them by giving and freely giving of themselves and their passions to be sure the gospel is carried out. Amen. We've got to understand how important it is. Read, first of all, Matthew chapter 10, verse 41. Listen to this. Whoever welcomes a prophet as a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. And whoever welcomes a righteous person as a righteous person will receive a righteous person's reward. Can we understand that, how important it is? Hey, look, guys. And I'm not trying to be a rubber arm here. But the way you treat the men and the women that bring the truth to you is really important. You can treat them like an old shoe if you want. You can be rude. You can do all those kind of things. That's not God's will. They, they are no different. They're just a, a sheep that God made a shepherd out of. But I want to tell you, God, God trusts them. And he gave them that call for a reason. And so that verse in Matthew, uh, verse uh, chapter 10, verse 41, read it one more time. I just kind of like the sound of it. Whoever welcomes a prophet as a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. And whoever welcomes a righteous person as a righteous person will receive a righteous person's reward. And guess who's going to hand that reward out? Jesus himself. That's what the word said. You'll personally do it. Amen? So guys, people in leadership that are standing in the gap making up the heads, it's important how you treat them. Amen? It's hard to say that when you're the man in the pulpit. But I want to tell you what, it's still important if I do have to say it. Amen. Amen. You know, there's a lot of honor. He's talking about the honor there, but you also know that there's double responsibility. It's not an easy spot to be in. But I'm going to get off that because nobody's laughing. <laughs> Amen. I just want God to be pleased with us. And God will reward those who support the chosen servant. How do you support them? You pray for them. You encourage them. We're in it. You give a freely of yourself. You give freely of your possessions. Amen. And, and I'll close tonight with three things I want to point out to you that pastors earn how they earn this reward. This is how pastors earn it. And you're going to find out why I'm so head set on staying in the Word and not compromising. 
in 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 2, it talked about the pastor is going to get the reward that feeds the church. He feeds the church. And I'm not talking about uh, uh, pizza. <laughs> They're going to get rewarded for that too. But I want you to listen to it. Uh, in the scripture, 1 Peter 5 verse 2. Be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care, watching over them, not because you must, but because you are willing as God wants you to be, not pursuing dishonest gain, but eager to serve. Eager to serve. Feeding, if he feeds the church, it's important. And God put that importance on him. All right. Uh, let's look at verse uh, 2 in that same chapter. Verse 2 also says, it talks uh, 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 taking the spiritual oversight of the church. That's a, one of the reasons pastors are going to be rewarded. Not only because he feeds the church, but according to verse 2, he takes the spiritual oversight of the church. He will not compromise or water it down. He watches over it. Amen? How, how important is it that, that New Day have somebody to watch over New Day? If we don't, then the wolves will come. And they'll sneak in in sheep's clothes. Somebody has to be in, in charge. Somebody has to watch over the flock. Amen. That's, read that verse 2 one more time. Listen to it closely. Be, shep be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care, watching over them, not because you must, but because you are willing, as God wants you to be, not pursuing dishonest gain, but eager to serve. Eager to serve. And then I'll close with this. He's going to be rewarded, that pastor, is uh, because he is an example to the church. Has to be an example to the church. And uh, that's in verse 3. Same chapter, uh, uh, verse 3. Listen to this. Not lording over it, not lording it over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. Not lording over, bullying, uh, I get accused of that sometimes. You're trying to bully me. No, I'm watching over you. And if you think it's bullying, you just need to pray. Because it's not what it's intended to be. Amen. And, and if you're under pastors are to walk with God by faith, then they're to be spiritual leaders. Spiritual leaders. Amen. And, and, and there's more. I'll stop there tonight. There's one more crown I want to talk about, and, and I'll do it later uh, when we get another opportunity. All right? And I hope you're learning something uh, about how important it is, the way you walk, the example you set, the words, how you respond. Then it's important. Young men like you, that God's called, you need to adhere to the teachings of the Word. You'll write all those scriptures down and work on them in your own life. Young men like these that are that are called to ministry. I mean, it's and there's a lot of people, ladies, that are called. We've got to be an example, right? We've got to hold up the banner of the Lord. And we can't water it down and, and, and not be the example that God wants us to be. Amen. Let me pray. Would you stand? Hallelujah. How many of you want to get a crown? Amen. Amen. How many of you just want to barely get in? It's there, and I want to just barely make it into heaven. Not me, I don't want that. There's more. There's more. Let's pray. Father, tonight, thank you again thank you, Jesus. for your word that's infallible. It never changes. It's sharp. It's powerful. It pierces going in and coming out. We know, Lord, tonight that we need the diet of your word. 
We need to feast on it, apply it to our lives every day, Lord, because it's your word that's a light unto our path and a lamp unto our feet. It's your word, Lord, uh, that we can speak and light up this dark world. It's your word, Lord, uh, that we can speak and turn many uh, uh, from sin unto righteousness. It's your word, Lord, that can change the mind of that one, Lord, that's lost and undone and on their way to eternity uh, in hell. It's your word, Lord, uh, that makes the difference. And you backed it up. You had it written by holy men of God as they were moved upon by the Holy Spirit. And you said it was so important that heaven and earth might pass away, but not one word that you've written would ever fall void. And so tonight, Lord, I thank you for your word. And I pray that every person here that's listened tonight, Lord, will write this word in their heart like David so that we will not sin against you. And we'll give you the praise, the honor, and the glory. And Lord, tonight I ask this. Lord, help us to win one soul. Help us, Lord, to lead somebody from sin unto righteousness in our lifetime. And we'll give you honor and glory for it in Jesus' name. And everybody say amen. 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 God bless you. Uh, see you Sunday. Lord willing. Praise the Lord.